Greetings everyone, it's Professor Fiore. In today's video, we are going to talk about common mode rejection ratio and its importance. Now, if you haven't looked at the two prior videos that we're talking about diff amps, you definitely wanna watch those first. I'm gonna run through the DC and AC calculations on this fairly quickly. Our goal here is to really focus in on common mode rejection ratio, a very, very important characteristic. So. Here we have a fairly standard bipolar differential amplifier using a very simple kind of uh, tail current source down here with just a negative power supply and a resistor. All right. So we would expect, given these values, right, I would get five volts. We'd lose seven tenths on a base emitter, ignoring the drop on RB. That gives us 4.3 volts to drop on the 2.2K. We get a little less than two mils. That'll split evenly, so I got a little less than a mil on each one of these transistors. Put a mil through 8.2K, we're looking at around 8 volts here, 15 volt source, subtract that off, so we're looking at about 7 volts on each of these collectors to ground. All right? Knowing that we have a little less than a mil, that's going to give us upper 20s, maybe 27 ohms for an R prime value. We don't have any swapping here. So a single-ended input to a single-ended output should give us a gain of the RC, right, the AC load, divided by 2 times R prime E. So if I look at this, 8.2K, 22K, that's going to be divided by 2 times, you know, upper 20s. Uh, maybe we're going to get 55 ohms or something like that, right? So we're looking at a gain of maybe, I don't know, 100-ish, right, from this uh, same collector, right, Co this collector back to this input, this base, there would be an inversion. From here to the opposite, there would be no inversion because going on this route, we would see here a uh, follower, an emitter follower, and that would be feeding a common base, and neither of those invert. So from this input to this collector, the opposite collector, there'd be no inversion, all right? All right, let's do a real quick DC analysis over here just to make sure that uh, everything is set up correctly. All right, so let's go and check our tail current source. All right, we're getting uh, 1.96 mils, so a little less than two as expected. I'll just go to collector number one resistor. Here we're getting uh, a little under a mil, so that looks good, 973 roughly. And if we go and look at the voltage on the collector, we're getting about seven volts, right? So that's great. Now, a uh, thing to notice in the simulator, this is sort of an ideal best case situation because we don't have normal tolerance problems. When we say resistor uh, collector one is 8.2K, it's exactly 8.2K. These two transistors have the exact same parameters. So the matching in here is perfect. But in the real world, you're going to have variations between these things. You know, you grab two resistors out of a bin that's labeled 8.2K, chances are neither of them are going to be exactly 8.2K and they're not going to be exactly equal to each other. All of those little changes, all of those little asymmetries produce an asymmetry in the gains that we see. Now, the thing to remember is your load voltage, in other words, the voltage sitting at one of these output pins is essentially the difference between the two inputs. Now, I'm only drawing this with a, a single input, right? This is an easy way to, to uh, verify the gain of your amplifier in lab. But basically what you have is the gain of path one times input number one minus the gain of path two times input number two, right? You subtract those. Hence the idea of a differential amplifier. The difference is what's important here. And by the way, I'm saying path, gain path, because as I mentioned initially, you know, if you're looking at this, this input to this collector, well, that's just a single common emitter amplifier. And the same thing's true over here. If you have an input over here, input number two, you know, to this collector, it's the same deal, right? But when you're going to the opposite, right, from this input to this collector or this input to the opposite collector, it's really sort of a two-stage situation, right? You got a follower and then a common base. If you're going this way, it's follower and common base, right? So in any case, if, and this is the key point, if those two gains are the same, and that would be true if we have perfect symmetry here, 
then you can factor out the gains, just call AV1, AV2 equal to AV, and your load voltage is the gain times VN1 minus VN2. All right, so if we have a situation where the two inputs are identical, they should perfectly cancel, and I would get zero output. All right, I only literally get the difference between the two inputs. So we move over to a circuit like this, and I'm applying the same exact input to both inputs. So this should, if everything was perfect, if everything was ideal, right, if this was a perfect differential amplifier, and I mean perfect beyond just the resistors and so forth matching, then I should get zero volts for my load out here. But in fact, that doesn't happen. Right? We don't really see this. You build this circuit in lab, you're not going to see zero volts out here. So I've got a 100 millivolt input back here. Now, you couldn't, by the way, use 100 millivolts on the preceding circuit. You don't even maybe put in 10. Put in 100 millivolts, you're, you're probably going to make the amplifier clip, right? So when we do common mode checks, we can crank up this input a little bit. It's just so that we can see the common mode residual with a little bit more accuracy. In any case, the thing to remember over here is that your common mode rejection ratio is essentially the ratio of your ordinary gain divided by your common mode gain. Okay, so the trick here is to get this common mode gain, ACM, as small as possible. Alrighty? Now, how do we find the common mode gain? Well, the common mode gain basically is whatever your load resistance is divided by two times the resistance of the current source, right? This is just modeling a current source. It's a very simple sort of current source. You take a voltage source, put a resistor in series with it, right? How good is that model? I mean, how good is that? Well, it depends on what else it's connected to. The internal resistance of this current source is the value of the resistance. So in this case, it's 2.2K. Now, if this is uh, foreign to you, you haven't seen something like this, go check out the matching text, the semiconductor devices text that I wrote. That is a free OER for the download. Just go to my websites, download that. If you want a print version or a Kindle version, you can get those really inexpensively on Amazon. Um, your choice, right? Details are in the description of the video, but just download that and I have a, a much more detailed analysis of where this comes from in the text. But when we calculate this out, or when we go through this, your our load is the 8.2K biasing resistor in parallel with the 22K physical um, external resistor, load resistor. So we have two times the 2.2K, which is the internal resistance of the current source, and we wind up with a common mode gain of 1.36. Now you might say, well, that's pretty good because you know we estimated our um, our ordinary gain to be, you know, maybe around 100 or so. Yeah, but you know, if you look at the ratio of that, the common mode rejection ratio is less than 100 to 1, which is not very good, not very good at all. We want more than thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. You know, if I could get a million, I'd be a pretty happy guy. So, um, you know, a common mode rejection ratio of 75 is not good, right? So I would really like to get this number much, much smaller. Well, let's just verify what the heck is going on here. All right, so I'm gonna do a transient analysis. And we'll take a look at the legend here. So our generator, green input, all right? And our output, so that's 100 millivolts, right? I cranked up this input to 100 millivolts. And the load is the maroon, which we can see is a bit bigger. Let's just get a probe on here and see uh, what we're getting. 133.6. Okay, so 130, almost 134 is we're getting for a value there. So we estimated 1.36, so we're getting 1.34. All right, how do we make this better? Well, the obvious answer is increase the value of RE. All right. Well, in order to do that and maintain that same current, we're going to have to crank up the value of the negative power supply. So we can do that. 
So here I've jumped up the power supply from five to 15 volts and we've increased RE up to 7.3K. Now, without going through all the calculations, you know, we should see an improvement, right? You know, an improvement of a factor of, you know, three and change, whatever, from 2.2K to 7.3K. So let's take a look. All righty, where's our legend? Okay, so the scale on this is different than last time. So our green is, is the input, there's 100 millivolts. We can see that this V load signal is considerably smaller, right? If I go back, you know, it was bigger, it was up here at 1.35, whatever the heck it was. And now it's really come down, right? So here's 500 millivolts right there. So, you know, where are we, right? You know, 400 or so. So, you know, yeah, it got chopped down by a factor of three and change or so. Well, very quickly, you can see what the problem here is. If you want to make a common mode rejection ratio that's, you know, 100,000, this resistor has to be insanely large, which necessitates a crazy large power supply, right? I mean, right now you're at plus and minus 15 volts for these power supplies, which is a standard bipolar power supply for your run of the mill op amp. So this becomes very difficult. Well, how do I come up with a better current source? Well, there are options. A better option is to just junk this whole idea of having a resistor here and use something that actually makes a nice constant current like another transistor. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna tap off the 15 volts through a resistor. And this is a Zener diode, about a 5.1 volt Zener diode. So that's going to establish a nice voltage from base down to the other end of this RE. I know there's going to be roughly 5.1 volts here. That's going to be held constant by the Zener. Now we're going to lose 7 tenths across the transistor's base emitter, but that remainder is going to drop across our resistor. And we should get, I've, des, I've thrown in values here that should give us the same, roughly the same currents, same voltages. I mean, they're not going to be, you know, accurate to within a tiny percentage, but just to verify that, right? Last time we had like seven volts on the collectors. So let's go see what we get. And I'm getting just a smidge over seven. So this is set up pretty much the same way. All right. We, we, we get the same AC gain. Um, you know, things are gonna work pretty much the same, except the internal resistance of this current source is huge. It's the internal resistance of this uh, bipolar transistor. Well, okay, you know, we can be talking hundreds of Ks, mega ohms, you know, all depending on the transistor, how it's biased and so forth. But let's just go check, right? Let's just go check and see how much of an improvement we've gotten. Hello. All right, so there's my VGen back at 100. My VLOAD, I don't see a darn thing, okay? So I am gonna come, after, come, come in here and um, change my scale because this is tiny, tiny, right? And so now I only have a 10 millivolt scale and still I can just barely see a little bit of variation. So let's do that again. Now I got it down to a one millivolt. So here we are. Our load voltage with this improved current source is a fraction of a millivolt, right? Here's one millivolt up here. Here we are down here. You know, we're like a, I don't know, a hundred maybe microvolts somewhere in that vicinity. Not even, let's see, where do we got? Oh, I'm getting 60, about 66 microvolts. Yeah, I would say that's a, more than a subtle improvement, right? So let's go, let's go um, back. So this is what we have now in our large voltage, large resistor version looked like that, okay? So which one would you rather have? All right, that's a huge, huge improvement. Okay, so it does cost you some extra components because before we just had the RE, now we have to have a bipolar transistor, a Zener, and uh, this resistor over here to establish the Zener turn-on current. But wow, 
talk about a huge improvement in common mode rejection. So it's all because of this having a much, much higher internal resistance. This is a much nicer ideal current source, right? It's a much closer to the ideal than just hanging a resistor out here with a negative power supply. Now, there are other things you can do. Typically, um, you know, if you were doing a, a uh, integrated circuit design, instead of using this, this works well if you're going to do this in the lab because you can just grab these components right off the shelf and just build this. But if you're going to do uh, an integrated circuit design, you can take advantage of the close component matching and probably put a current mirror in here. That would be a typical sort of way of biasing this thing, setting this up would be to set up a current mirror, right? Instead of using this Zener sort of tail current source. Um, something else you could do would be to use a FET, right? You can set up a FET as a constant current diode, basically. When you short out the gate source, you wind up uh, just drawing whatever IDSS here is, as long as the power supply is big enough, which in this case it clearly would be with a 5457. Um, so whatever that IDSS is, that's what you're gonna draw for a current source. And this would have a much higher internal resistance than, than you know, the initial, initial circuit we had, which just had the resistor out there. Whether or not it's better than the bipolar is gonna depend on the components. The nice thing about this is it's fairly simple. You just have the one FET, instead of all of those other components, you know, the uh, biasing resistor, Zener, and so forth. All right, so it's a much simpler circuit. Although, in all fairness, uh, repeatability on FETs, FET performance parameters, is a little bit wider. So trying to get the same performance out of this FET after FET after FET is going to be a little bit trickier. But it is certainly a way that you might consider, right? So this, as far as building something in lab is a, is a practical thing, I would suggest you even give it a whirl. You know, you build this up. Um, certainly you could do it in a simulator, but it would be nice to just build this up in lab and check it. There's nothing like having a real world circuit there that you can probe with your scope and so forth and see what you get. All right, well, I hope that clarified some things on common mode rejection. We'll see you next time.